Welcome to the Inferno Cast. Today's guest is an eighth degree black belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, and he is known around the world as one of the best martial arts instructors, Mr. Pedro Sauer. How are you doing today, sir? Hey, I'm doing pretty good, Caleb. Thank you very much. I appreciate the invitation. It's always a pleasure and an honor to be here with you and be able to share some kind of Jiu Jitsu thoughts with your, with, your, with your audience. Absolutely. We're excited to talk to you. I really wanted to go back to the beginning, um, as far as when you were in Brazil, you're doing different types of martial arts. How did you find Brazilian Jiu Jitsu specifically? Man, I found Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. I actually found Grace Jiu Jitsu. I, I don't even knew about Brazilian Jiu Jitsu at the time. I found uh, Grace Jiu Jitsu through a friend. Uh, his name was Hickson Gracie. And uh, we used to hang out on the streets just as a friend and, and, and double date and do things together. Uh, we probably, you know, 14, 15 years old, young kids. I have never heard about Jiu Jitsu in my life. I have no idea. And I got to know Hickson. And um, I was introduced to Hickson, actually to Jiu Jitsu, or, or, through a friend. His name was Bauru. He was the one who introduced me to Jiu Jitsu. Wow. So were you doing martial arts before this? Yes, I did. A, when I was a kid, I did Judo for a couple of years. Uh, Professor Aroldo. It was my, my instructor, uh, super nice, very talented guy in, in Laranjeiras in Rio de Janeiro. And I did judo that uh, for like probably a couple years. It was me and my brother. We are the same size. Actually, he was a little bit bigger than me, even though he was one year younger. He was a big guy. Well, today he's 300 pounds man, so he's huge. <laughs> so he was a big dude. But we did judo for about probably a year and a half. And um, my mom used to have a chauffeur, uh, a driver, we used to take us there. And one time, me and my brother, we tackled and we broke his arm. Oh, so no. <laughs> we lost our rights to, the, to judo. That's, when, that's how we stopped judo. Oh, man. Boys being boys, right? Yep. Well, that's exactly what happened. When you were introduced to jiu-jitsu, you were fairly young. Was it as profound on you at that age as it is for some adults that find it a little bit later in life? Like, did you know that this was the ultimate martial art or, the, or this is what you were looking for? Or was it just kind of the next evolution that you were just training? You know, when I started, uh, my, uh, the first time that I saw, I didn't like it. I didn't like it at all. And it took me almost a year, uh, over close to a year and a half to go back to the academy. Because Hickson was trying to, to get me, you know, uh, Hickson was trying to get me on, on the academy. And I didn't know enough about Jiu-Jitsu. Hickson used to say, oh, Pedro, you like to box? You know, you like Taekwondo? Come to check Jiu-Jitsu. I said, Jiu-Jitsu, what the hell is that? And, and I used to kind of make fun of him. Man, you, got, you like to grab guys too much. I like to grab girls. Uh, that was kind of my, my joke around. And Hickson just was a nice guy. I was smiley. We got along very well. Very friendly, very down-the-earth guy. So one time he asked me for a ride. And I gave him a ride to my car. And it was a parking stall right in the front of the academy. I, had, I was forced to stop it, take the park stall. And I told Hicks, listen, I'm not going to train. I already saw you guys grab it. I don't like this kind of stuff. So when I arrived there, it was Elio, Grandmaster Elio Grace was there. And I remember him giving me a, a, you know, a big, sh shook my hand, a big, big kind of hand, shook my hand. So Hicks, that's your friend you've been telling me that's a martial arts guy. I say, listen, I just came here just to see Oh, no, nobody coming here without C. You got to do it. So Elio forced me, you know, he, to put a 16, year, 16 ounces gloves and, and to go to the match and start to having uh, uh, matches with people. And one of the guys was Hoyler. And uh, I just remember that uh, at that moment I discovered that Jiu-Jitsu is not fair. <laughs> I love it. Jiu-Jitsu is not fair. That's it's awesome. not fair. For, for the person who understands Jiu-Jitsu as a self-defense, See, that's kind of, it's been like a, how many times you heard about, oh, you know, this sport jiu-jitsu, you know, self-defense yeah. jiu-jitsu? We heard all the time, man. Yeah. Well, I understood this from the, my first day. On my first day, because I was introduced by Elio, he, he made me, uh, without a doubt, he, he, he put me to test to see how the thing worked. And I honestly, I done my best. I mm -hmm. did everything that I could. I spent half an hour throwing up on the toilet on the bathroom after my first day of class. I got murdered completely. I left the, the gym. I, I couldn't even breathe. 
and, and I remember Hickson gave me a gi. It was a gi, and his name was Victor Vasconcelos, and I still have his gi. Really? It was, a, it was one of the students uh, gave me the gi, and Hickson told me, Pedro, uh, he used to call me Pedrinho, say, actually, he used to call me Drope, because my name is backwards, Drope. Right. So he said, if you stop training Jiu-Jitsu, you got to bring this gi back to me. And I was like, no, I need to start. I need to learn. I need to start. I need to learn. So he gave me the gi. I wear the gi until the last breath, uh, until it was uh, almost completely falling apart. And you still have the gi, and you haven't had to return it because you've continued on. It's been close to 50 years now, man. It's been 40-plus years now. Wow. That is amazing. Well, so whenever you had this experience, you realized that jiu-jitsu, like you said, it's not fair. It's, it's an amazing thing. How long do you feel like it was before you gained momentum as a student, where you started doing better? Do you remember that transition when you were like, man, I'm learning some stuff? Yep. yep. In, in my personal experience, it took me a long time to, to, to get something out of jiu-jitsu. But uh, the reason for that, that I was in a, in a school, you know, facing Hicks on Grace every night. You know, it's a different story when you walk in the academy and you have to face Elio Grace every night, Hicks on Gracie, Hori on Grace, uh, Helson on Gracie. You know, all those guys, Hall, everybody was there. So I was a little kid. I was so fragile. I was a little stick. I was 135 pounds, no more than that in a good day like a stick, no muscle. So, yeah, jiu-jitsu was very trick for me. It was special in the beginning. Took me a long time, but I can tell one thing. After my first class, I felt that I couldn't go home and, and make my, home, my, my roommate say uncle. Really? That gave me this kind of confidence. Yeah. That's, and it was after the first day, you, you knew that it was going to get better. That's... Hmm. But it took me a long time, and long time i went through through hell like do you know you think, for students uh do you think that the struggle of you learning jujitsu is what made you such a great coach well i think what, what uh, you know i honestly i gotta be honest I, I i don't think myself as a great coach what i see myself was like a, hey i try to do example what works for me and uh, i i adapt a strategy of uh, understand self-defense and try to understand jiu-jitsu. That was my, my thought. I need to understand jiu-jitsu. And I knew that if I understood jiu-jitsu for myself, down the road, I have to start to learn and study jiu-jitsu and try to understand jiu-jitsu for my opponents. And I think that's what I did. And I, I, I incorporate uh, jiu-jitsu. I try to bring quality values as a human, as a, as a good social person, a social being, I try to bring this to the, to the mat. So I think that's what I did, the difference. I don't see myself as a great coach, but I think I, I incorporate the values that my mom gave to me as a man, as in education. You know, I, I went to college, I, I studied, I, I, I did, a, you know, I did college, I did like a courses, I did a lot, of, a lot of studies of my life. I never thought about doing it, being an instructor. So the instructor came to me later. It was really after. But the benefits of jiu-jitsu that I've been saying for so many years, and on the beginning, a lot of people made fun of me. I used to talk about the social benefits of jiu-jitsu. And today, look what we are stuck in a home negotiating social situations with our wives, with our kids, with our friends. Wherever we live in the home, we need to negotiate social situations. And I believe that's the number one benefit for jiu-jitsu. Any practitioner will benefit socially when you incorporate those values. Yeah, I mean, I agree, you know, and I can see what you're saying was because 20, 30 years ago, jiu-jitsu was so close to fighting, MMA, Valley Tudo, NHB, you know, like it, it represented, <coughs> excuse me, it represented that tough, rough and tumble, like I'm going to beat people up, but so I'm sure that that idea at that time was not as popular because people didn't have the foresight to see like the long term and what was going to happen. Um, and for you to see how much it was going to bleed into people's lives. Why do you feel like you were able to see that so early? You know, it's very simple. I got to be honest is that uh, what you see as a myself today, uh, as, a, as a person, as a growing up individual today, 
when I was a kid, I was completely wacko. Hard to believe, huh? I just can't imagine it. I, I got kicked out from 12 different schools. <laughs> Not academies. I'm talking about schools that you go to, you know, kindergarten, school. elementary school, yeah. high school. I got kicked out from 12. I was super hyper and I used to take medication. I took medication for years, probably close to 10 years. And uh, I done everything that you can possibly, I was a complete, and the reason for that is that uh, I was just way too smart for my age. That's exactly what it was. I started driving a car when I was eight years old. Yeah. And I was very friendly and I was treated females with a lot of respect because, you know, I came from mom's uh, education and mom's, mom, mom's manners. And of course, my dad was very good uh, influential on me too and a lot of other older people. But I was a very, um, uh, I started everything in my life very young. I was way too young. And I got a chance to see the social benefits because I quit medicines right in the beginning. And Elio Grace was the responsible guy. He was the guy to, to actually make me believe that I was not crazy. Really? So you had a lot of influences and people telling you that there was something wrong with you and that, you know, that you weren't normal. Um, and it was, you know, which you see a lot in today's society where you get kids that are overachievers, that the, yep. the standard school system doesn't fit them because they just they understand things quickly and they're curious and and they can move forward faster but when you don't have resources for that it becomes the kid that just doesn't fit in the box and yeah, so exactly. to have master Helio, you know be able to kind of connect that for you that was like there's nothing wrong with you it's maybe the system just doesn't fit you exactly and you know he told my mom uh, elio ended up to be a very good friend of my mom and by the way they died on the same day Really? Of the same year. Yeah, same day. They, they disconnected the same time. So it was, a, it was, it was very, it was a big influence on myself. And he was a good friend of my mom. So what happened is that my mom opened up to Elio. And she told, oh, Elio, you know, Pedro, he does this. Pedro does that. You know, he was so hyper. He was this. He'd been in so many schools. And Elio made a, a comment to my mom and said, Maybe if I give Pedro a $100 bill, and tell him to eat it. You think you eat it or he put it in his pocket? And my mom kind of kind of awkward said, I'm pretty sure he put it in his pocket. Say, if you put it in his pocket, I can still save him. I can still fix him. <laughs> that's awesome. And that's what he did with me. One, one time uh, I was in downtown Rio de Janeiro at the, at, the, at the First Grace Academy, downtown First Grace Academy. I was a little kid, probably 15, 16 years old. And Elio got in the mount position. Uh, I was sparring with him. He used to spar with me all the time because I was a fragile kid. So he used to spank me all the time. Uh, uh, so he got in a mount position and I tried to escape. I tried to push and pull, escape, push and pull. And I was doing everything I could to escape and I could not budge it. And uh, when I kind of stopped for a little breath, he looked right in my eyes and said, oh, you crazy? You think you're crazy? And I look at him like, what? You know, completely out of the blue. And I didn't, I didn't understood that he was talking to my mom and my mom was telling him, Hey, Pedro's kind of crazy. And he kind of called my stuff on the mat and say, Hey, you know what? You can trick your parents, your son of a gun, but you don't trick me. And at that moment on, I was like this, the first person who, who I couldn't trick. Yeah. That's amazing. So, was he, you know, a, a, I'm guessing he was a very strong father figure in your life, you know, leader, mentor that, uh, you know, was a part of, what was that influence like? What, you know, was it always the coach of just like train harder, do better, or was there a soft side, you know, where like he understood your struggles and what you're dealing with, you know, what was that leadership like? Man, he was a general. And he was a general. And he was no... No quarters for nobody, my friend. If you don't fit in, you, can, you don't belong there. And what Elio did, Elio built a, a, a group of people. Mm -hmm. Think about that. We're still together. We're still training. We still have a lot of people uh, that, that was, was under Elio's direct supervision that still train. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think that's me, that says something uh, because he was not just passing mechanics. He was passing strategy. 
how to utilize jiu-jitsu as a growth, uh, you know, to, to, to make human better, better people, how to utilize mechanics uh, to neutralize. Uh, and he was like this, listen, you, and one time he told me this, Pedrinho, somebody can be twice your size, three times your size. But if you understand jiu-jitsu, it's going to be a blink of eyes, you're going to make him say uncle. Now, if you don't understand jiu-jitsu, you're going to be trying to impose jiu-jitsu. And that can be very detrimental unless you and your opponent, they are the same size, same age, everything equal. The moment you give enough space, size, your age, you better understand what you're doing. Absolutely. You know, so do you think his high standard is what has kind of led to the success of the family and everybody that trained with him, you know, of just that we perform at our best no matter what attitude? Yep, and you got to get ready no matter what. You have to be ready anytime. There's no such a thing, oh, I'm not feeling good. There's no things like this. And, and by the way, when you, you, when you come to the academy, you're not feeling good, that's when you, that's when you used to make us suffer the most. Man, Ed was brutal. He was a, he was a general. You know, he was paying people. Uh, I remember Ed one time paying uh, uh, workers, from, from like, a, like a construction workers, to come to the, to the academy to try to beat us. And Ed used to say, hey, you guys, how much money you guys make today? I will make five bucks. I'll give you guys 10 bucks. But you guys need to hold those guys over here. Can, they cannot escape. So in my mind here, Elio at the time was preparing us. When we came to America, that's exactly what we found it. Really? That's yes, an interesting because, perspective. I, I hadn't thought about that before. Yeah, we found exactly this because we found unpredictable people. Everybody was unpredictable. Everybody was bigger than us. Nobody likes to lose. So I, I went to Salt Lake City, Utah when I moved to America. You know, that over there is the Mormon community. And a very great community. I, I love them. Great people. Very nice. But they don't like to lose. For sure. And it's not just that. The prophet of uh, the church, it was a wrestler, Joseph Smith. So every kid in Utah is a wrestler. That's how I met Mark Schultz, you know, the Sanderson brothers. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the father used to, I remember, I remember rolling with the father. Really? Oh my gosh. So I, much history. I, you know, one thing that I remember uh, in 1991, when I moved to Utah, one of my students from uh, Heber, Heber City, brought this dad and a whole bunch of kids for me to do like a, a, some kind of a, a, a no holds, uh, a match, no holds bar. <laughs> he was a dad and a whole bunch of kids. And now the kids is all those Sanderson kids that are the Olympic champions. Yeah. They all end up to be champions. And the father, we, of course, we didn't spar fist-wise, but we grapple. You know, at the time, nobody knew jiu so I tapped. You know, always, you know, we tap the guy a dozen times. But those guys learned jiu-jitsu. The Sanderson brothers, I don't remember how many it was. I know Ricky Landell, one of my, my, my students since seven years old, ended up to be a very good uh, partner of one of the Sanderson brothers, uh, kids. Yeah. Wow. So you, yeah, so you kind of went from one hotbed of being with the Gracies doing jiu-jitsu into the wrestling hotbed of like, surrounded by all these you know great athletes that had a little bit of an acumen for grappling and i think that's the big benefit that you know wrestling brings to jiu-jitsu whenever you know people start training is at least they have ground acumen because i know that like yeah. you know where i grew up we didn't have wrestling till just a few years ago in the state so it was really difficult when people would start training jiu-jitsu they would just have no comprehension of how you would move on the ground and, you know, and with wrestling, you know, at least they're on the mat and they understand pressure and base. Um, so I'm sure that that really was, you know, made it more interesting and more fun for you as a coach because they had some level of skill, you know, a little bit different skill, yeah. but at least it transitioned over. Um, when you transitioned to America, what was that like as far as the culture shift? Was it a lot of culture shock or, or were you kind of world-laid, you traveled? What was that like? 
No, I, I was, uh, when I moved to America, I've been in America before in 1982, uh, my first time in America. That's the first time I came to America. I brought my gi, I, 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 I went to Florida and California. I probably call 50 places to try to get a, a sweat, try to get some train. I couldn't find one place to train. So 1982, I brought my gi, I, I left, I brought my gi back to, to, to Brazil. Couldn't find one place in America to train, to grapple or to spar. One place, just karate, and now the doors was closed. So it was pretty, it was pretty tricky. And uh, when I moved to Utah, I gotta say, man, to when I was there, uh, to have Mark Schultz coming to your school every night, that was a challenge, Rodrigo. <laughs> That's a tough guy. Mark was incredible. What incredible, beautiful. Well, he, the guy learned like a sponge. Very smart guy. He learned a half dozen of moves. Nobody could touch Mark anymore. So whenever you made the transition and you started building up, you know, the base level, which I think school owners out there understand, you know, I always call it the island because when you start a school, there's nobody except you and a bunch of white belts that don't know anything. And, you know, and there's just months and sometimes years of just, people understanding basics and fundamentals. Do you remember the turning point when you looked around and you had like a good group of training partners, you know, there was a, you know, some color belts on the floor. Like, do you remember when it was like, okay, we're, it's starting to work. Yep. Yeah. It was, that was right after Hoist. When Hoist fought the UFC one and I fought Mr. Utah right after that, I thought, okay, now we're going to have a, 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 some people coming. And the school started to grow and grow and grow and grow. And I, I was the first guy who put a program together. Nobody ever had jujitsu program. You know, we have the, uh, the Horio has some tapes. Um, uh, Hanzo has some tapes with Craig Kuka. Uh, Pedro Carvalho has some tapes. But as a curriculum, I was the first guy who put a curriculum together. And oh. the only thing I did, I put like hours. I said, you know what? I believe if you come here two or three times a week and you train for X amount of years, so you should get promoted. So I put minimum time off the mat. Yeah. So I come up with, okay, for you to be a blue belt, you got to have 100 hours of instruction, not sparring, just right. instruction. And after that, 100 hours per stripe. And, and that's how we start building the people because everybody starts following those guidelines. And uh, we build like a, a incredible amount of talent people because people, when you follow guidelines, you understand jujitsu. You're not doing just jujitsu. You understand. Mm -hmm. And when you understand jujitsu, you can understand your opponent's game. Now you're in a position to teach, to share, to, to make uh, somebody very weak, uh, super powerful, because you understand leverage. All right. You know, I've heard, um, I've heard an example or an analogy of like when you go to a college course, you can audit the class, you know, in which you don't get a grade, you just kind of go as you want and you absorb as you want versus when you're enrolled in the class where you take the test and you get a grade. And I've heard people talk about that, like with jujitsu of, you know, when you have a curriculum and a structure, you're enrolled in the class. But whenever you just do a lot of free roll and just kind of, you know, do what you want to do, it's like auditing the class. And they say that the same amount of hours training, you get a massively different result of somebody that's following a structured curriculum in which they're, you know, there's, I don't know about tests, but, you know, there's aptitude checks and things of that nature versus when you just kind of show up and do what you want. Would you agree with that? Totally. Totally. What, what happens when we, when, we don't, when we don't have curriculum, uh, we leave holes in our game. And you, we might not notice those holes for 5, 10, 15, 20 years. You might need, don't even notice those, those holes. But you're going to notice those, those holes when your stamina, when your ability starts going down. Yeah. So you, you hit the age of 40, 42, 44. Your age starts catching up at the age, you know. And you have those 20 years old guys that can put like, you know, a very kind of intense strain towards you. And you can do very well in the first two, three, four minutes, and pretty soon your game get in a plateau. And after ten minutes, is everything down the road, down the hill. So that's when you're really gonna pay the price for those holes, because you didn't understood how to put the thing together. You didn't. You only thought about yourself instead. Use jujitsu 
to get in inside your, your opponent's mind. You know, we need to understand jujitsu as a mirror. Everything has to come as a counterattack, right? Because if you wait for, you, for the guy to do the move and apply the mechanic, it's too late. But when you, when you know it's a mirror, I, you feel the intentions. And when you feel the intentions, you kind of set up possibilities and you give him two chances. I'm going to give him two chances to start those moves. But I'm not, going to fin I'm, going to, I'm not going to let you finish any of those moves, but I'll let you start. In the meantime, I'm going to catch you right in between. And after that, I'm going to hitchhike. That's the real understand of jiu-jitsu. You know, in boxing, you hear the same thing or striking arts where you talk about the rhythm, you know, like one, two, three, four. And when you listen to counter strikers, they talk about, I want to counter between the beats, you know, between yeah. the rhythm. And just like with jiu-jitsu, like what you're talking about is you basically, you are absorbing what they're going to do and giving that opportunity because you know in between the moments is when you're going to counter and you're going to capitalize. How would you advise or, or lead somebody that doesn't really understand that yet because they're still newer to jiu-jitsu? What are some exercises or analogies that you give people for them to start finding those opportunities? Well, I, I use a strategy. It's a very simple strategy that I use this since I'm a little kid. Not because I want to do it, because I had no other option. When I was a kid, I used to get submitted 50 times per night. <laughs> and I mean 50. When I was tapping 20 times, it was a good night. <laughs> I was doing well. Well, but what happened is, after all those submissions, I started to understand the game, not just my game, but his game. You know, imagine trying to understand Hickson Grace's game. You know, the guy has five moves ahead of you. So, very tricky. Almost to say impossible. But I started to understand a, a, a blue belt game. I started to understand a purple belt game. And eventually, I started to understand a brown belt game. And eventually, I started to understand the black belt game. And my, my aim, my game, it was almost to try to look for something uh, uh, that would work on Hickson. And I could not figure it out. I could not find out anything. Because Hickson is an expert in self-defense. You cannot make him say uncle. You can start in any position. And I mean any position. He will let you start in any position. And you're gonna, he's going to escape. And he's going to make you say uncle in the position that you started. And nothing right. you can do to stop him. So wow. imagine I, I, I spent 15, 15 years of my life seeing Hickson and Elio every night. Yeah. So that, that, I think that came to my, uh, to my uh, game, uh, the, the, what I understand about Jiu-Jitsu, came straight from Elio and Hickson. And of course, my personality, I was being friendly. I was being a joker. I was a... Uh, how can I say? I was never, never been a, somebody who like, you know, oh, Pedro Sal, we need to beat him. Uh, I was a likable person. Let's put it that way. I was friendly. I was respectful. I treat everybody always fairly and, 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 and nice. So I was somebody who never, I never had somebody tell me, oh, I don't want to train with Pedro Sal. Actually, the opposite. Everybody wants to train with me. Right? Because I was a great student. He's a great yeah. student. And pretty soon I started getting pretty good. You know, took me time, but I started getting, getting decent. And eventually when I was a brown belt, I was a, a pretty decent grappler. And, and everybody wants to grapple with me. I was welcome in every academy. You know, and I used to travel. I used to do things and, and visit other schools because personality-wise, I was welcome in other schools. Yeah. And I always go back to Hickson, you know, and... and uh, you know, Hickson was a we, we, good friend. He was a guy who I have a lot of respect. Uh, down the earth, very down the earth guy. Super bright. Yeah. Unbelievable talent. Do you feel that there's a huge need for analytical comprehension skills to do jiu-jitsu at high levels? Like, is that something that's like you have to have a mental aptitude for high-level jiu-jitsu? Well, I think you can do jiu-jitsu even without anything like that but you're only going to be doing for a small period of time. When you're in shape, when you're younger, you know, when you 
fit in the well, like physically you you just you see the jujitsu practitioners today they are machines they they you know they spend hours on the mat you spend hours in the gym you spend hours doing uh alimentation uh you, you know you take care of all the areas so jujitsu today is a machine now we need to understand is this is that do you understood jujitsu when the machine didn't have gasoline or just after your machine is a completely tune up Mm. that's the biggest problem because down the road your machine is going to get out of tune and now you have habits i'm not sure if you saw a video i post a video of a friend of mine on instagram uh, a few months back he's a core belt and i'm rolling with him i didn't even see that now yeah i think in my, on my instagram you can see that i think i posted that the guy's a friend of mine super nice guy talented this guy was a monster this guy, when I was a kid, used to beat the crap off a little, used to kick my, kick my butt, left and right. So he came to the, to the, I was doing a camp in Brazil. You know, I do camps in Brazil for the past uh, 11 years. I done already 21 camps in Brazil. Wow. And I take people from America to, to Petropolis. We stay there in a beautiful paradise, waterfall. It's just a, a, a paradise place. Well, this friend of mine, he came. And he was saying, hey, Pedro, I'm still competing. I'm still in top shape. I'm still doing it. And he was like, I was like, man, that's awesome. And, I, you know, that's great. Hey, Pedro, come on, let's roll. Let's, let's, let's review the old time. I say, dude, you know, if you're still very active, the way you're telling me, and I got to be honest with you, I got 11 screws on my body. I have already 15 operations. And I cannot jeopardize my joints, you know, go crazy. No, no, don't worry. We can go slow. So after the third day, I accept and say, okay, listen, dude, this guy used to be a stunt man. Yeah. But he's older right now. He's, he's, he's 62, my age, 62. Well, what happened is that I, uh, if you watch the video, you're going to see I, I was trained with him and I felt that I, I, I was pretty much maybe three or four steps ahead of every move. I don't talk about just the moves. I'm talking about reflex. When he was kind of doing any kind of reflex, any kind of contraction or push and pull, I was ready to navigate around. And, and that explained because that guy that you, if you see that they roll, when we were little kids, this guy used to spank me. But I was somebody very light. I didn't have jujitsu. I didn't have good jujitsu. He was very fit, triathlete guy. He used to do triathlon, swim, bicycle, jogging. Black belt in jiu-jitsu, black belt in judo. The guy is like a species and a stunt man. But that's what I'm telling. When the age uh, arrived, he didn't have my, the physical ability to keep up all the mechanics. It doesn't mean he didn't know jiu-jitsu. He knew a lot of jiu-jitsu. The problem is that the timing was off. Right. Do you see that with a lot of naturally athletic, strong people, that their comprehension of jiu-jitsu sometimes is slower than like, the smaller people? Mm -hmm. Yeah. The guy who has a lot of uh, physicality, he does not, it's not a, as a requirement. Like, uh, hey, my friend, the only way you're going to grapple here, you know, you got to understand Jiu Jitsu. You got you to learn those moves. Otherwise, you cannot do nothing. Well, I'm a fit guy. If I learn half a dozen of stuff, I can do a lot of things. I can stop, I can push, I can pull, I can resist, I can, I can fight back. But the problem that we cannot do this, uh, we build habits. And those habits stays with us. Just like, you know, somebody goes like this on your eyes, you close your eyes as a muscle memory. That's exactly how we build jiu-jitsu. So it's like action, reaction, focused training. And down the road is just reaction. When you get older, it's, it's a re reaction. Is everything's fake. When you get older, that's why it works. Because if you know, let's imagine I'm an 80 years old man and I put my hand in your collar and you know my second hand is going to go, you're just going to get my hand, I'm going to take it out. You're just going to peel my hands off. I'm 80 years old. Right. But if I put my hands on your collar and I make a little hook and I distract you with the little hook, pretend I'm going to sweep you, pretend I'm going to lift you, now I can go ahead and put my second hand there. And this, this has to come as a muscle, muscle memory. I need to get inside of my, my opponent's muscle memory. And by the way, 
we have to think about opponents and training partners. We have a, a, I like to start with training partner. Right. Because down the road in the future, you might end up in a training partner too. Imagine yeah. two eight years old guys training. They are two training partners, right? They're not three, two opponents. I like that differentiation because, um, like, that's a terminology I use in my school a lot. Is you know your training partner. I usually don't use the word opponent. Um, now, whenever it's like a competition camp, or if, you know I got fighters that are being prepared, I'll adjust the the vernacular a little bit sometimes then. But usually I kind of keep it different because. I'm trying to get these people to understand you're here to build each other so that we all get better. You're not here to build yourself by breaking down those around you. Um, and I like that you really differentiate that of, you know, the training partner versus the opponent because it can change back and forth. Um, especially, you know, over the years, that's a really good perspective. Um, if you start as a training partner in the beginning and you, and you, and you make a, a beginning of your career as a training partner, you're going to have a lot of memories in that period of time. And those memories is going to flourish back down the road 40, 50 years later when you're no longer, you know, a, 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 the stud in the school, the alpha male. But that little period of the time, that's when you polish your best moves. Really? See, and that's what's so good about Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and just the whole industry right now is because we're still connected to the originators, you know, most of them. You know, like the people that create this idea, like we still get to communicate. It's like me getting to talk with you. You know, you were there and just having a direct link, which is why I think that things like this are important from almost a historical point of view is it's trying to capture the wisdom and the moments and the stories too. But, you know, what you have been able to see, because when you were 20, there was probably a lot more of we need to beat them up, beat them up real good and make sure they know we can beat them up again. And then now... 30, 40, 50 years later, you're starting to see a different perspective of the journey and where, what really matters and where the values have shifted to where now you're able to pour into young athletes a much more well-rounded martial art you know, perspective, like you said, on life that bleeds over. So if you were going to pick a couple principles of doing jiu-jitsu that bled over into the rest of your life, what would they be? For you to do jiu-jitsu for, for a long time? No, for like a couple principles from doing jiu-jitsu that have helped you in other parts of your life? Well, the social, the social benefits uh, of right. jiu-jitsu, in my personal opinion, that's the number one benefit everybody's going to get. And I, I've been saying this for more than 30 years. And a lot of people make fun of me, especially the Brazilians. Yeah. You know, because we came here to fight. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what we did. We did. We fought every night. But I always thought about the social benefits because this happened to me. You know, uh, I, I saw myself being a more socially uh, uh, approachable person because jiu-jitsu. I saw myself being more comfortable in my own skin because doing jiu-jitsu. You know, I saw myself uh, being completely 180 degrees opposite what I used to be because jiu-jitsu. But we have to use jiu-jitsu not as a fighting art, but we have to use as a strategy, as a, as a human progress to, to make ourselves better as a people, as a person, as a human. Because we can be better human, way better human, when we understand jiu-jitsu. Now, if we fight jiu-jitsu, if we grapple jiu-jitsu, if we just want to go to the academy just for ourselves, we don't even, you know, what I just said here is just make no sense. Because the guys go there for, for uh, selfish reasons. When you're part of a team, that everybody there has good respect, got a good talents. Everybody there has got a good discipline. Everybody there has positive attitude. Everybody's bringing some good quality. And you start attracting those people to your mat. So pretty soon you have doctors, lawyers, you know, judges. You know, you have intellectual people come to your mat. And those people, they, want, they understand jiu-jitsu too. They, they, it's easy for them to understand. The, the problem when somebody is too intelligent, it's not a problem, but uh, what happens is that when somebody is too intelligent, they're going to question every technique. Why I'm supposed to do that? Why I'm doing this? Why are you telling me to go here instead of go there? So all those why can maybe slow down a little bit the progress. But if you just said, you know what, just do the move, just do the mechanic, and it's not against an opponent that's going to try to stop you. It's against a trained partner 
that's going to let you do the move. And you start seeing the film beginning, middle, and end. And pretty soon you can pause. You can start pause the film. And when you pause the film, you can dissect that mechanics. You can understand mechanics. Only when you pause. How can you imagine the, the movie? Do you remember the film Titanic? Yeah, yeah. Do you remember when the Titanic was leaving the dock and it was 5,000 people waving outside, saying like this? Do you remember that? Yeah. If I ask you, did you recognize, do you recall any person, any, any, any uh, clothing? No, not at all. Can you imagine if you could pause the video and you can analyze every single clothes of the people at the time, you know, 19 what 1913s i guess when it happened imagine that that time if you could pause and analyze every dress colors oh that's too tight that's too loose that's too long that's too short this hat's too big can you imagine if you could analyze in jiu-jitsu we can pause and dissect every single technique by slices and that's the real benefit to them, my friends, socially. Hmm. Because even though you already know the move, just take one breathe, one little tweak on my shoulder here, one little, one little let my shoulder go down a little bit for the technique change. And you have to right. adapt this to your game. Well, and, but if you understood, and it can go on forever, which I think is what makes people fall in love with jiu-jitsu even more is because it just keeps progressing. You can keep diving deeper. Um, and when you look at this layering principle, when it starts with a white belt, what do you try to get them to focus on? You know, it's like you're a newer white belt, you're new to jujitsu. What are some of your principles or pillars in which you build the jujitsu program on? Uh, what I do, we have a, a, you know, our curriculum is kind of pretty much by the book. So no matter who you are, you arrive in the academy, you're going to get a card, you're going to get a number, and then that number is going to collect every technique. So let's imagine if you did a class, uh, you know, the, the class tonight to be Kimura, uh, Americana, and straight arm bar. So when you do those three moves, you receive credit. And who is your partner? Uh, this guy, this guy, this guy. Uh, how many times did you practice? Oh, I done for 50, I, I done the move 50 times. You create a database. And that database allowed you to see hey you know what you are you i, I think you're wonderful in arm bars and uh you love the arm bars on the left side but you are missing on the right side you are off balance you did 150 on the left only 20 on the right so let's try to equalize that uh you've done great moves you are great you you're a great lapel you i see that you very good work with the lapels you got a great chokes but uh your foot locks are not in the game at all. So let's try to work on the And the, the program allowed us to build people like that. It's almost that you can't manage what you don't measure, yeah. which, you know, just like you said earlier, is whenever you just teach without a curriculum, you'll get holes because bias, you know, like my body works a certain way as a coach. So I show moves a certain way because it works for me and it doesn't force me to expand the details or the curriculum you know, pieces outside of my game. Cause like for us, we have a curriculum and there's a couple cycles of the curriculum that everybody knows I'm not a fan of cause it's not my favorite, you know? So when that one yeah. comes up, they know, cause I'm like, okay guys, we have to work on this. Um, cause it just doesn't fit my game very well. Um, but I don't want my students to be a victim of my own bias um, or my instructors to be a victim of my own bias, you know? So, cause everybody has to interpret and create their own style of jujitsu but they can't do that if they don't have all of the working pieces and parts, which is what you're providing with them tracking, you know, the system. It's much like higher level education. It's much like you're running a, a college type system where it's like you have to have this piece and this piece and credit hours and labs and, you know, a very methodical procedure, mm -hmm. um, you know, it seemed, and it's obviously working. I mean, you've, you've, you know, renowned for what you've done in the industry. So it seems to be working. What do you see the future of jujitsu looking like? Uh, I believe, uh, uh, you know, jiu-jitsu, the future, I think is we're going to continue to grow. I don't see, I think right now, during this time of the crisis of this virus, uh, I believe that a lot of people 
who was just, uh, you know, was not running a nice school, was not running a professional, uh, it was not connected to somebody who was, you know, helping out. A anybody who was loose guy there is going to suffer. It's going to be hard. And the people who's going to suffer the most, they, they shouldn't. Because sometimes you think about this, man, now in quarantine, you know, I miss just jujitsu. But I don't miss this, uh, you know, I don't see socially. Jiu-Jitsu never helped nothing socially to me. Because the only thing that I did was a great workout. Uh, those people are going to suffer. Yeah. But the people who has good programs, the people who, who builds people, uh, who, who the programs design uh, to, to make the people f get better, appreciate, be more respectful. Uh, you're more respectful towards the females. You're more respectful towards the, to the young guys. Uh, the, towards the old people, but towards the finesse, finesse in your hands. When you focus on that, you build good people and people appreciate, especially this time. Yeah. You know, I'm here at home for two months, like everybody else. I didn't have one single time that I can say that I have an uh, argument or I got in any kind of deal or, or some kind of harshness. No, nothing. You, you know, two months, okay, I'm gonna be here two months or it'll be three, whatever. I'm going to cruise. I'm going to take this as every day. It's going to be a wonderful day. I'm going to make the day better. I discovered, you know, when I moved to America, I was a carpenter. So mm -hmm. now I'm doing carpenter work. Uh, I do mechanical work too. So I, I've been restoring cars. I restore already a Porsche. I oh, restore you're a cycle. car guy too. Yep. Oh, me too. I grew up a motorhead just... Since nice. I was a kid, if it if it goes fast, I, I'm into more ahead, it. Then. Yeah. What kind of car do you like to build? Uh, I'm more of classics, Chevrolets, Fords. I, I've learned to appreciate Fords. I was always a Chevy kid, um, but like my first car was a Chevelle, and then I had a '66 Nova. But um, I had the '67 Buick Skylark. I ended up with because I broke down tires for an entire weekend for this guy at a salvage yard. And I was like 14. And he said, you want a hundred dollars or do you want this old Skylark that was, didn't run, rusted out. And I was like, I want the Skylark. I want the car. And I still have that car to this day. And nice. actually over the last 10 years was able to start restoring it where we got all the interior and the body work and, you know, the drivetrain and, um, so yeah, I just, and I almost feel like jujitsu kind of correlates to those types of activities because it's problem solving and creativity. Exactly. You know, like exactly. it's just, I feel like they're very integrated. Um, you know, I don't get to work on cars as much these days with the schools and business and stuff like that, but I'm definitely, you know, I'm planning for the next 15, 20 years of there'll be a time when I can go back to it. And, um, and I, I just feel like there's certain skills that pair, like you hear people talk about surfing, being in the zone. And it's very much like jujitsu whenever you're rolling and you're in the zone. And then you look at, puzzles and and things like music where you have to be very analytical and then i look at things like carpentry and and working on cars and mechanical because you have to understand like visual spatial comprehensions of how to take things apart put them back together because that's what you're doing in jujitsu is um i mean a perfect example i was talking to uh, yesterday i was talking to uh somebody about the fit-in in judo you know they use that terminology the fit-in before the throw and it's almost like that's what you're doing with jujitsu is you're trying to fit in. Oh, it was Egan Inouye. In, in, um, Inouye. Egan Inouye was talking about, he's like, you have to visually see what the next move will be to see if it fits. Um, and it just it made me think about working on cars, where it's like, is that exhaust manifold going to fit in that hole? Like, you know, like you just, you visual space, you have to understand it. Um, so I think it's interesting that you have other hobbies that correlate with the jujitsu structure that you've created, you know. Um, how well do you feel like it complements the rest of your life as far as, like you said, like you're emotionally not having issues right now with the, with the lockdown because you've, you know, jujitsu's taught you how to find that balance. If you were going to advise somebody how to find that balance when they don't have a lifetime of jujitsu experience yet, what would some of your initial advice be? Well, I think it's always a smart for, for people to look videos, to uh, learn mechanics on, 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 on the videos and, and try to observe smooth techniques, not acrobacy, not, not fancy stuff. Something that is doable uh, for, for, for a person at that moment. And, and uh, you know, if the guy's a brand new guy, you know, it's kind of hard to talk about advanced moves because the, first of all, the guy cannot do. And, and the second of all, if he's going to do, he, he got a chance to get hurt. 
And if you get hurt, he's, never, he's not back on the mat. He disappears. So I think that's super important in the beginning is, is to everybody uh, during this time, if you have not understood jiu if you have done, my best thing to do, watch videos, try to relax, don't get in panic, and just think about this, man, if you're on the bottom, you know, and, and somebody is, is on top of you and put a hand in your neck, it's just one hand, you know, you got to check the other hand. Instead, try to worry about the first hand. Nothing you can do about the first hand is there. So, you know, just put your effort and put your thoughts in things that's going to bring you results. If it's not going to bring results, put on the shelf. Like Don't that. worry. If stuff you can do can bring results, go there, pick, let's dissect that. And that's something. I'll show you something for you over here when you talk about the mechanics. Let me show you something here. Look at this yeah. here. Oh, wow. Yeah. This is my grandfather here. Yeah. Look at this, look at this first factory. Oh, wow. Can you see that? Yeah, I can, yeah. What, what year was now that? Now if you go to... It was 1913. Now look at this. This is the factory here. Yeah. Look at the size of those gears. Wow. That's, that's, an, that's a person walking over there. That's a, somebody walking there. See two guys there? Yeah. Look at the size of those machines. What kind of factory was that? This is a gear factory. See the gears? Yeah. Still over there. This right here. I want you to the, when you get a chance. Wait. What did the what did the gears go in? Just my grandfather and uh, he started this factory in 1913, and he died in 1969. It was the the biggest fact, uh, gear factory in South America. He he has uh, over 35,000 patents of gears. Oh my gosh! Wow. Good. So my family lost the factory. Uh, my dad received the factory as a inheritance, and my my dad and my dad's brothers and sisters they all got embellished. So uh, the sour factory does not exist anymore. But this gives you an idea about jujitsu and mechanics, and that that mechanics, and that's what is in my mind here right now, is that the the mechanic engineer to solve the problems, to put those things together, those puzzles together. And I think that's what I bring to jujitsu is a little mechanic. I like now, that. Now, when you get a chance, when you got a chance, uh, Google the first Harley Davidson factory. You know the motorcycle Harley Davidson? Yeah, yeah. Google the first Harley Davidson factory. You're going to see a picture just like that. Exactly the same. Same machines. Wow. Man, that's a really cool story. It's kind of like, you know, your, your family history of the ingenuity and the engineering of it, you know, and now you're engineering how to fold people in clothes while they're still in them as the joke and the meme on the internet says. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. That's true. I think that's what I bring the most. Uh, I believe that I bring this, this mechanic engineer. And the other thing too that I, I can tell, you know, growing up around Elio, all those years, I was able to see Elio at six years old. So my age today, when I met Elio, Elio was my age. Yeah. And I was around him until he was 95. Wow. So for 35 years, I socialized, you know, we socialized. And I, I, I remember seeing his jiu-jitsu. When he was 92 years old, he tried to kick my butt. <laughs> That's awesome. So if you, had, uh, you know, and that kind of, I had three final questions I wanted to ask and, and they kind of go in order of their relevance because, uh, and since you bring up Elio, um, but my first one is if you were going to pick one of the greatest lessons that you've taken from your relationship with Hickson, what would it have been? Uh, well, with Hickson, man, you know, if you, I don't even know. It's thirty something, almost forty years of uh, you know everyday training. Man, we we spent so much. I think Hickson helped me out tremendously in every aspect of my game. Every aspect. Just for you to see how we go. Uh, last year, he asked me to go to London uh, 
for the Hicks on Grace Cup uh, to help help out to do the self defense demo. And uh, we went to the. I, I was in a hotel. He was in a hotel. So middle of the night, hey, what are you doing? I'll oh, come by here. So I went to his room. And uh, it was about probably 11 o'clock at night. Can you believe that you were staying till 3 o'clock in the morning doing that moves? <laughs> Two guys, 60 years old, till yeah. 3 in the morning. That's so awesome. that's what you just does for us. So if you were going to choose, if you had to pick a fundamental principle um, or a major influence, if you were going to pick one from Alio Gracie, what would it have been? My, the most incredible prince I learned from Elio was the use of leverage. That was the most, most thing that I learned from Elio. It was how to, to use leverage in everything that I do in life. And I mean everything. Can be on the mat, can be doing mechanics, can be cutting trees, can be yard. No matter what I do, every time that my hands get together, that I do something, I, I understand that if I twist my angles a little bit, I'm going to have leverage. So I, I look for leverage. Uh, my challenge today will be to, to discover and to analyze leverage in any situation, even in a pen. You know, what the leverage? You know, over here, I can break it. Over here, I cannot do nothing. Right. You know, but like this, I know I'm pretty sure I can break this. But no yeah. way I can break that. And I want to analyze everything that mechanic-wise come in front of me. And I want to use jujitsu to help me out, to keep the cool, to clean my mind. That's all the thing true. Clean your mind. Don't bring your mind busy. You Got to be clean, wash, spotless, and analyze this, the pure leverage. Bring to the pure leverage. Man. I like that. And then my last question is if you were going to leave like your children with a piece of advice to be successful in life, what would that advice be? Just one advice. They only get one, maybe two. <laughs> well, I'm going to give two. The number okay. one, believe in half what you see enough that people tell you there'll be one so don't worry about nothing give discounts for everything and everyone discounts and the most important part is to be a respectful human being to rest amigo if you got a respect you can walk a, a, a good respect a good smile hope open any door you know Absolutely. good manners being treat people fairly treat the people uh, the my, my device i'll give this treat people the way how you'd like to get treated excellent you know don't do excellent. nothing that you don't want people to do uh, uh, to you those well, kind of is, things goes long way man yeah i mean that's really excellent insight and i think it's very valuable for people to hear you know, somebody with your life experience and what you've been able to achieve and accomplish to have those perspectives and views that people can take a lot from that. Um, cause you're, you know, there's a lot of people that find jujitsu because they're missing something else in their life, you know, or they're looking for something, trying to find answers. And sometimes the jujitsu mats is how we help them find those answers. So I think mm -hmm. hearing your, your opinion and your take on the philosophy of kind of jujitsu in the real life is going to help a lot of people. And I really appreciate that. It's my pleasure, amigo. Everybody, we all, no matter who you are, I am, I'm a believer that when we wake up as a humans, we try to do our best. Yeah. I don't believe that we wake up in the morning and say, today I'm going to mess it up. Today I'm going to do my best because I'm going to mess it up something. We don't right. wake up that, that way. We try our best, but sometimes our best falls short. Sometimes our best is not, uh, you know, is not uh, uh, enough. Uh, as long as we negotiate this, as long as we calm, as long as we're respectful, you can always do it again. You can always learn. Uh, we, have, we have solutions for everything. With jujitsu mindset, we can solve anything. 
I agree. And if it cannot be solved, why are you going to be worried about? Exactly. It's the whole thing of, you know, worry about what you can change. Don't worry about the things you can't change. That's how it goes, Well, I appreciate the time. Um, it's been great to hear the stories. Thank you so much for giving us some perspective on the beginning and training and what you're doing now. And I know that you're definitely a leader of the industry. Um, you've, you've been a pinnacle for people to, to learn jujitsu and, and your system of being a coach and a mentor has influenced a lot of people across the world. I really hope that you, uh, you guys are able to get through this unique, difficult time. And I definitely will be in touch soon. Is there anything you'd like to finish with? I would like to say hi to everybody. Thank you, everybody, for watching. I'll be doing, I think tonight, I'll be doing at 6 o'clock tonight. I believe I'll be doing some kind of stuff that we're doing here right now. How about this again? Zoom? Zoom? Yes, Zoom meetings, yes. I think we're going to do something like that at 6 o'clock tonight. So I believe I might be doing some techniques. Anybody like some questions, problems, anything? I'm, when I bump on the mat, I'm still a little kid. I'm still like a, a I still love jujitsu. I cannot help it. And stay positive. Don't worry. Things are gonna get better. We're gonna pass this. I've been telling. Do you remember a few months ago we talked about Amazon on fire? Yeah. Can you believe how quick we forgot about that? I know. It's just, it's one. It's like one issue to the next. You know, short memory sometimes. So, yeah. But we'll make it through. And I think that your uh, your voice and encouragement definitely is going to help us do that. So I, I appreciate everything you've done today and we'll definitely talk soon. I appreciate it. Kevin. Thank you very much for the same. My best to everybody there. Bro.